well. Um, so we will be recording this meeting uh, so that those who were not able to make it can rewatch and gain some ideas that way. Um, so again, good afternoon. Um, I am Hannah Jardine, one of the teaching and learning specialists here at CTRL. And this session will be on emotion. I will pass things over to, or pass it over to my colleague who will be co-presenting and then we'll get started. Hi everyone, my name is Mary Catherine Stumbos. I'm also a teaching and learning specialist here. All right, so if you haven't yet been to one of our Brain Fuel series sessions, uh, the goal of these sessions is to bring together, um, or bring you all together to talk about the science of learning. So some of that stuff that we know from psychology, neuroscience, anthropology, sociology, bringing on all the research on how people learn um, since education is a very interdisciplinary field of study and dig a little bit deeper. So this one specifically is about emotion, how emotion impacts learning, both positive emotions and negative emotions. So uh, I see in the chat some ideas coming in about what emotions we hope to invoke um, or promote in our students. So this feelings of connection, engagement, exciting, um, safety, calm, trust, interest, joy, for sure. Um, curiosity, a little bit of the aha moment emotion. And what is it? That is certainly a type of emotion, right? That discovery emotion almost, or that satisfaction that comes when we learn something new. So, keeping all these positive emotions in mind, we will certainly talk about how these can be very motivating, why they can be motivating, um, how to promote these types of emotions, and how to avoid the types of emotions that prevent these types from happening. So our session learning outcomes are by the end of this session that you'll be able to describe findings from that interdisciplinary body of research on emotions impact on learning um, and apply principles from the science of learning to your teaching practices using an equity-based lens. So start us off, um, a lot of what we're presenting here today comes from different resources, but particularly this book called The Spark of Learning by Sarah Rose Kavanaugh um, that is all about how emotions impact learning. So if we want to truly motivate and educate our students, Sarah writes, we are much better off targeting their emotions. Really, we can't, um, we can't avoid it. Emotions are very tied into the way we're thinking, the way we're behaving, um, the way our brains are functioning or not functioning in learning spaces. So it's helpful and important to recognize all of that and um, think about what we should do in response. So some general thoughts to start us off with. First, I want to um, provide a quote from one of our CTRL student partners. So we have undergraduate students who work directly with us and um, providing insights into the student experience, informing our resources and programming, and also creating some of their own projects on topics of choice. I will, um, I'm always looking to plug the Student Partners Program, so I'll drop a link in the chat for those who'd like to learn more about the student partners and the work that they've done with us. But this quote that's up there um, is from a conversation I had with the student partners very recently, um, just a week ago, in, prep in preparation for today's session. Um, and I asked them, you know, how do emotions impact your learning? Just to start off the conversation. And this student said, how do emotions impact my learning? Ugh, in so many ways, especially at this point in the semester, as we're getting towards finals, we're stressed about our stress. And we know the professors are stressed too. We all need to give ourselves a break so that we can continue to function. Otherwise, we get stuck in an unhealthy pattern where the stress builds up, prevents you from doing what you need to do, causing more stress, and the cycle continues. Uh, so I thought this quote was really, um, really powerful, also really concerning thinking about, you know, if we don't address some of these negative emotions, it can lead to further negative emotions and further um, moving in a negative direction in terms of learning. So what can we do about that? We'll think about that together here today. <clears throat> but um, to talk about emotions and learning in general, know that positive emotions enhance learning and negative emotions inhibit learning. So that's kind of the foundational statement that will guide everything we talk about today. That emotions and learning are inextricably connected, as I mentioned before, 
and they can influence cognitive skills such as attention, memory, executive function, decision making, problem solving, and regulation, and including self regulation. So I will pass it over to Mary Catherine to talk a little bit more about how we can use emotions to our advantage and some of the positive emotions in learning. Thanks, Anna. Um, so we have this chart here um, that I'm gonna go over in just a second, but the, the bottom line, just to reiterate sort of what Hannah has been saying is that the trick for effective learning is creating um, activation with positive associations. Um, learners are more likely to pay attention to, think about and remember emotionally charged information. So it's not that emotions are bad or inhibit learning, but um, across the board, but that can be true with negative emotions. Um, while the positive emotions are essential for learning. So this nice little chart here shows us, or graph here, kind of gives us an idea about one way to conceptualize emotions, especially as they relate to learning. So we can think of ourselves as activated or not activated, the sort of up-down axis, axis, the y-axis there. And we can think about the emotions as positive or negative on the x-axis, left-right axis. So um, the ideal area for learning is when we're activated in a positive way. So alert is the best, but think about also excited, elated, happy. Um, the worst is the opposite quadrant where like you have negative feelings and you're not activated. So sad, depressed, lethargic, fatigued. These especially come up a lot when students are burnt out and they just don't have any more energy left. So um, we wanna be thinking about how we can keep students in that alert area. Um, and just to go over the other two areas, um, the positive but not really activated is um, also not ideal for learning because they have to be engaged to an extent. So it's nice when they're nice and relaxed, but that's not going to be ideal for learning. Um, and then when they're activated, but in a negative way, when they're nervous and stressed, that can really harm their conversion of the material into long-term memory. I think you can go to the next slide. Yeah, and I guess to say one more thing about this positive not aroused that came up with the student partners is that these are important emotions to be experiencing as a student, but maybe not in the classroom, but that you are giving students time or, or helping them to think about when are you going to make time to be relaxed and calm in between your classes or at night when you should be going to bed. Um, so those are positive, those are important states to have um, to support, you know, your physiological development in terms of learning, but not to experience, say, in the classroom when you're um, actively learning. Thanks. Yeah, that's an important element of it for sure. Um, so these um, these posters, um, the the paper that's been written on on the left hand side of the screen is. Um, from, there's some artifacts from Hannah's Psychology of Education course here at AU. So students came up with these before and after reading about the topics of how emotion impacts learning. So we will pause for a moment just to give you a bit of a chance to read some of what the students wrote on here um, in different colors. So this is how learning is impacted by excitement and happiness, thinking about these positive emotions still. Um, so we see that they're more engaged, there's more confidence, there's more of an intrinsic motivation, um, helps you connect to your goals and passions for the future, find those goals and passions. So a lot of these positive kinds of things. Um, and what we can do to leverage that excitement is we can show our own authentic enthusiasm for our topic, for our course materials. We can help students see the personal relevance of the coursework connecting it to their interests. This takes some getting to know your students, which is a great thing to be doing, everyone should be doing. Um, and I know it's easier in smaller classes, but to the extent that you can connect it to students' personal interests, um, that can really help with getting them excited about the material. Um, and another thing you can do if maybe it's not directly connected to their interests, maybe it's a required course and they're not super excited about it, is involve some puzzles, mysteries, get them um, in this problem solving, mindset that gets them curious and um, excited to figure out what, what's going on. Um, another great quote from one of our student partners is here um, at the bottom. So it's important professors show students how what they're learning is associated with something they care about. 
So even if it's not maybe related to their professional goals or their academic goals, maybe there's a way it can tie into their personal interests um, or find ways to connect it to things they are interested in um, and, and tie that into the course. Next slide, please. So the next set of positive emotions um, that we'll talk about here is um, humor and joy. And these are emotions that really increase, emo examples of emotions that really increase motivation and engagement. So again, pause for a moment. Um, makes learning more fun just to read some of these comments. Um, I will note that the humor and joy are um, not in that um, I completely ideal state necessarily. So we can see some students wrote that it can be distracting, um, but it can also make it easier to learn the material um, if it's if it's in that kind of sweet spot. So we can facilitate you. We can use humor and joy to facilitate interactions between students, um, cooperative learning, community building, all of this can help learning. Um, we can also use storytelling to help make that happen and that helps um, the students relate to the material better, especially if we use a really diverse array of stories and just making learning fun. So maybe gamifying your lesson or um, having different ways for students to engage actively. So another great quote from the student partner, take us outside, being on the quad feels so positive, the sun, openness, nature, it makes me feel happy to be learning. So this is a way that we can um, engage joy in our classroom is just to, you know, uh, being, being in nature um, for the most part, maybe not today, it's a pretty gloomy day, but if it's a nice day out, can really help students just feel um, happy to be there and that can help them with their focus, it can help them like get that learning into their long-term memory, all that kind of thing. Um, next slide. Yeah, and just to follow up on this quote, what I I thought it was very interesting that the student said that because my initial thought was, wouldn't taking you out onto the quad be distracting? Um, there's a lot going on on the quad. There's other students. You might be looking around, wanting to play frisbee, and they they actually said the opposite. They're like. No, because we appreciate it so much that then we're respecting that we're in class. Um, sometimes if I'm in class and I'm totally just kind of at a loss of energy, that's when I get distracted. I start looking at things online or just kind of zoning out. But if we were in this more positive state outside, then, then we'd be more focused. So I just thought that was an interesting perspective that I wasn't initially thinking of. Thanks for sharing that, Hannah. Yeah, that reasoning behind it. Um, and um, Shad wrote in the comments like how uh, people and students focus better when stimming or knitting. There are, it's maybe not true for every single student, but there are a lot of students who can focus better if their hands are staying busy. Um, so something to think about, like if that's bringing them um, joy and they can focus, um, then it's something that can be good for their learning. Um, the last set of positive emotions we'll talk about is hope and pride and how learning is impacted by that. So this is an example of how positive emotions can enable students to broaden their perspectives, see alternatives, persist through challenges, and respond effectively to um, criticism and failure. So some of the um, notes that students wrote on this poster, again, just pausing for a moment to, to look at those, motivation and passion and how passion um, circles, it's sort of a cycle. It, increases motivation, um, hope for my future students, hope to, because these were education students, but hope to get a good grade even is, can be um, motivating. Pride in being right um, can drive motivation as well. So it's a, it's a good way to, to give students a sense of agency and control over their learning if they have pride in what they're doing. Um, one way to do that is to design activities at the right level of challenge. So if they're con continuously um, feeling uh, like they're not quite getting it right and they're not sure what's going on and it's too difficult for them, they haven't gotten those skills yet, that will be really demotivating. Um, conversely, if you design the activities right where they're at that learning point where they can do it maybe with a little help and eventually do it on their own, that'll give them a very you know strong sense of pride in their work, pride in themselves. Um, and that can be really motivating. 
um, providing that positive, encouraging feedback about their competence and abilities will be key in that because um, the idea is not just to give them stuff they can already do, you know, nope, that's, you know, not really learning anything new, but getting them to the point where they can um, master those new skills and that new content can happen a lot uh, more effectively if there's that positive and encouraging feedback and um, meaningful feedback and and timely feedback and all of that can can boost um, that pride and that hope for I'll get there eventually if I keep sticking with it. Um, so I'll I'll read this quote. Hannah might have something to add to it, but just as a wrap up for our ideas about positive emotions, positive another student partner quote, positive reinforcement goes a long way, but we don't get it often. Students are so motivated by compliments, acknowledgements, and positive feedback. Let us know what we're doing right, and we'll want to keep doing it. So I think that's a really good reminder that we often get stuck in this, like, feedback has to be constructive and focused on the things they need to improve. But we also need to remember, as instructors, to point out the things that they are doing well, that students are doing well, especially new things that they weren't able to do previously. So I'll hand it back to Hannah. Yeah, maybe we'll take a few minutes to pause before we kind of shift into the more negative side of emotions. Um, if anybody has any questions or comments or things that are resonating at this point, feel free to drop it in the chat or raise your hand to share. We'll have lots of discussion later too. So yeah, yeah. We will also be sharing the slides after. So we'll have access to all of this and can zoom in better onto those posters. Uh, Mike, I'm, I'm assuming you mean uh, teaching in person and teaching remotely or virtual? Like that all of these things would apply either way? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the it'll look different. Um, like I'm just thinking of the take them out on the quad example. Like, what would that look like in a virtual space? But I mean, it could be taking a five minute break and being very explicit about during this break. I don't like. It's not a time to check your phone, but it's a time to get up and take a walk. Go, um, you know, find a, a a nice image to look at, or doing something more mindful. Um, having those moments where they're sharing um, more personal things with each other. So yeah, I think all the same concepts apply, but we'll just have to be more creative about how they apply. All right, so thinking now about some of the other more negative emotions and um, how students are responding to these and how they impact learning. So. As we might guess, unproductive negative emotions lead to low motivation and disengagement, not just guess, but know from experience in ourselves and with our students. Um, but we also wanna highlight, and you can see this in some of what the students wrote here, that negative emotions such as confusion and sometimes fear and anxiety to a certain extent can be powerful learning tools um, when they're at the appropriate levels. So for example, um, a comment on the poster is a little bit of anxiety can help motivate, but too much is overwhelming and distracts from actually learning. Um, so one suggestion is to aim for intellectual rigor, and that goes with what Mary Catherine was saying about the, the right level of challenge. So we do, um, you know, getting rid of fear and anxiety shouldn't come from lowering our expectations for students or expecting less of them but should come from reducing some of the barriers and burdens that our students might be experiencing that interfere with learning. So we refer to that as logistical rigor, meaning um, having them guess what they what you want them to be doing or forgetting or, or not reminding them of things that are coming up to make sure that they're keeping track of their own calendars versus um, having high expectations for the quality of work and the quality of learning. Um, Oh yeah, Michael's question of, can we define what we mean by learning for this discussion? And there are several forms of learning. And that's that's a really good question. <laughs> so I'd say um, it could be a number of things. So either students 
developing new knowledge or new skills or even new dispositions towards something. And then knowing you, Michael, in your case, those um, skills might be something that you're they're physically performing. Um, so it could be a cognitive skill versus a, a physical skill versus an emotional skill. So I think we're we're fitting all of these types of learning into that. Any comments to add to that, Mary Catherine? Um, no, I was just typing in a, a response, but it was basically the same thing that I think learning is about acquiring new skills or content knowledge. And I think any skills, content knowledge, emotional knowledge, all of that kind of falls into learning. Um, our understanding, I think, is that those work in similar ways, similar enough ways in, in uh, like cognitively that it's, this stuff we're saying about emotions applies to all of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so same, say you're teaching a, a dance class or a music class or an athletic performance class, there's still probably a level of anxiety that's helpful and a level of anxiety that's hurtful and that there's still this idea of getting to them to the zone of where you're pushing them to a next level, but not overwhelming them. So um, if you're getting someone to lift a heavier weight or to run a faster mile, the goal isn't to go from 10 minutes for a mile to six minutes and they fail if they don't make it, but 10 minutes down to nine and a half, down to nine, down to eight and a half. So um, I think always thinking about that, pushing students to the next level without overwhelming them by um, unfair, unclear expectations. Um, so other ideas here, reminding students of the control and choices they have. I think sometimes students forget that um, they have choice in the way that they are um, presenting their knowledge or that we are um, building in those moments for them. And of course, making our expectations clear. So always when talking to students, their anxiety seems to come from not knowing what the teacher expects of them. Um, so not knowing what the final, what's gonna be on the final, not knowing how the final will be graded, not knowing um, if you know this is exactly what they want or what are they're expecting. So making your expectations clear and or making opportunities for students to come to you with questions that relieve some of that anxiety so that they can do their best work. Um, something from the research we wanted to present is this idea of the zone of optimal confusion, which is kind of, if you're familiar with the story of Goldilocks and the three bears, I don't wanna assume everybody is, but if you are familiar, um, it would be like the just right zone. So not too hot, not too cold, but just right. So there's an, a point where we're not inducing enough confusion or enough challenge um, and we're not, but then there's also a point where we're, students might be overwhelmed or frustrated because there's too much confusion or too much challenge. So there's a zone of optimal confusion. And of course there's individual variability within that zone. So that's where um, taking the time to get to know your students is important to recognize that, um, you know, there's there's a balance, but then students might fit differently within that balance. And then, so we talked about fear and anxiety, and then there's also um, the word stress is comes up a lot at this time of the semester, especially as well as frustration. So how is learning impacted by those? Um, so these negative em emotions can stifle effective learning dispositions especially if a learner perceives a threat, their attention will be drawn to it, interfering with their ability to learn. So being aware of the emotional states that individual students or the group are in, checking in regularly and providing support and encouragement as needed. Uh, at this time of the year, it might even be a time to start your class with a, a mindfulness exercise or some kind of just, let's Let's take a breath here together before we even jump into the content or how is everybody doing? I think the, the students that we work with speak a lot about how valuable it can be for a professor to just ask, how are you all? And to really hear their answer or to give them a chance to share with their peers how they are or journal about how they're doing. Um, having a brain dump or an emotion dump at the start of class, just get all your thoughts and stresses out on paper, crumple that up. Now we can get started with the lesson. Um, all sorts of ideas for check-ins there. And we could, we'll certainly um, be interested during the discussion to talk about more 
ideas of things that you've already done or want to try. Um, and then also providing low stakes opportunities to make mistakes and learn from them. So having those ungraded quiz questions that help them prepare for an exam if you give exams in your class or having drafts of final projects that they can turn in and get feedback on or review with their peers. Um, having these different moments where they're confirm that they're on the right track and that they're getting the feedback that they need to improve. So the research also shows that the impact of stress on learning um, depends on the time be between the stressful event and the learning. So this kind of connects back to what Mary Catherine presented at the beginning in terms of the activated negative, activated positive, um, passive negative, passive positive. Um, so what this diagram is showing is that these red arrows are a period of stress and then uh, there's different periods in terms of when we learn things. So in the top, stress at those points enhances memory. So this research, they determined that uh, when stress is happening right around when the information is being presented, so the encoding part of the memory process, it actually enhances the memory. And that kind of goes along with this idea of the zone of optimal confusion. If we're kind of stressing students out and that we're giving them something that's challenging, we're giving them something that's new, that gets them thinking, gets them curious, um, that's gonna help them to remember that information and to encode that in their memory. But if they are stressed, so this arrow on the bottom, um, if they're stressed significantly before class, and Mary Catherine will talk about this next, that stress might be coming from outside of class, something that has nothing to do with your class, but something going on in the world or in their personal lives, that can have an impact on learning and memory, as well as stress that's happening before retrieval. So stress that's happening while they're studying or stress that's happening when they're building upon that information all can have negative effects. So um, summary of key takeaways here, it's okay to insert a little bit of stress and anxiety um, before or while you are presenting the information, but stress when trying to retrieve the information and outside and long separate from that learning process is not helpful. Michael is asking, is it helpful to get a little stress before sleep? That's a good question. And I have to go back to the study. I don't know if it's just that they didn't have enough space to make this, this gap right here a little bit longer. Um, I think it's more that it's the stress right before and right after the learning is happening. Um, but I do know from um, what we know about the impacts of uh, sleep and memory formation and whatnot, that studying right before bed is a lot more helpful than studying the morning you wake in the morning when you wake up. So um, having kind of, and maybe that's sort of stress related. So kind of stressing the learning before you fall asleep is better than stressing the next morning when you're trying to remember it. And I'll just add, if it's okay, um, yeah. that I think stress can have a lot of different, um, like there's different types of stress that we can think about. Um, and that's important here also that um, there's sort of like thinking about stress as being somehow kind of activated or, um, you know, emotionally aroused and is, um, it can look a lot of different ways. So if we're talking about curiosity and engagement as a type of stress, that's very different than some of the negative types of stress we'll be talking about next. Yeah, jumping jacks, breathing exercises, stretching. So Mike, for those who don't know Michael Rosengart, um, he is, I don't know your official title, but I go to the strength and conditioning classes that Michael hosts for faculty and staff and they're incredible. And he is an excellent instructor. All right, uh, and then one more question. As people become more proficient experts at learning, at learning, does stress need to be increased to maintain? Hmm, that's another good question. Um, I'd have to look into that. What I, I suspect that it doesn't just because we already have this like big network in our brain at that point of where the information can fit into. So it doesn't take as much work to build on the knowledge, if we already have extensive knowledge of something. 
um, versus building that framework of knowledge to begin with is like a lot more of like a, you know, learning curve there. Mm -hmm. So my guess is we don't need as much stress once we become more proficient in a field, but in terms of like, once we're better at learning, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. Good question. So um, we wanted to talk next about emotions coming from outside of the classroom and how that can impact our students' um, learning. So students enter our classroom with positive and negative emotions already geared up, right? They're not coming from a, a void. And, you know, as soon as they walk through the door, everything is just wiped clean. Um, they are coming in maybe from having just taken a really hard exam, or maybe they found out their dog just died or a family member. Um, so they already have a lot of things going on in their lives. Um, and some emotions for some or even many of our students stem from traumatic experiences that can get unintentionally triggered. So even if they're not feeling that emotion immediately before class, or even if they are, um, things that happen in the classroom can bring out those emotions from traumatic events. Um, and as we've talked about <laughs> repeatedly, those extremely negative emotions hinder learning, especially if they send students into a sort of fight or flight response. If they're, and, and traumatic emotions often do that. So what we can do to address these is think about using trauma-informed pedagogies that recognize that our students have these experiences, experiences that happen outside of the classroom um, and aim to like limit potentially triggering exposures but also just warn students so that they can be prepared um, and maintain that learning disposition. So having flexible attendance policies can help with that if things are happening as you're teaching the class, but also having content warnings, um, especially for things like gun violence, like sexual violence, things that we know our students are experiencing either firsthand or secondhand, um, just letting them know we're gonna talk about this do what you need to do to prepare yourself. And if you absolutely can't handle it right now, it's fine to remove yourself from the class. Um, also giving students choice in assignments um, in terms of readings, uh, content of the readings or what kind of skills they're developing. Um, maybe some students aren't ready to engage their bodies in your classroom. Um, and I know that sometimes different assignments want students to engage their bodies in different ways. So just giving them some choice there um, can, can really help mitigate that, you know, like recognize that students have lives and have potentially um, experienced traumatic events outside of the classroom and that what you're talking about in the classroom can um, unintentionally trigger those emotions and, um, and hinder learning, but there are things we can do to um, help students through those emotions um, and help students manage them in our classroom and stay in that learning headspace. That makes sense. Hannah, do you have anything you want to add to that one? Uh, no, I think this this quote kind of builds off of it. I want to share that. Sure. Um, so another, another great student partner quote, we really love our student partners. Um, being too emotional to go to class is real. That doesn't mean I can't learn. I love that my professor has an option to zoom in when I need to take care of myself but still want to stay on track with the class. The structure is there for when it's needed and we don't abuse it. Um, so I think this really highlights that having those options for students when they are dealing with really tough things and maybe they just haven't been able to put themselves together enough to feel comfortable getting out of their room, going to class, showing up in front of a professor, um, showing up in front of their peers even. Um, Zoom is, if your classroom is set up for it, you know, it's a great way to give that option, but extrapolating from this and thinking about how we can make our classes places where students have different options for how they show up um, so that they can learn um, in whatever space they are in mentally or physically is always, um, always a good thing and helpful to, to learning. And I'll pass it again back to Hannah. Yeah, so now we're going to um, present some discussion questions. So the way we set up these brain fuel uh, sessions, and typically they're hybrid, 
Um, thank you for the last minute change to fully virtual considering the weather today. Um, the Now we break into discussion. And so for anyone who, we also recognize that some of you are doing this as part of a lunch break or might need to be somewhere else, but we do wanna make space for discussion for those who are interested. So um, the Mary Catherine just put some questions in the chat and I'll put them on screen and kind of read them out loud. So these are the questions we'll talk about and we'll go into smaller groups. I can, I'll lead one breakout room, Mary Catherine will lead the other. So we'll be there to facilitate discussion. Um, how can we use emotions to support learning, our anxiety and stress emotions to avoid or embrace? How do we help students navigate these emotions at the end of the semester? Uh, how can we help students process emotions that they may be bringing to class that are interfering with learning? And how do you recognize students' emotional states? So again, this, this is for, um, for whoever's interested in digging deeper into this, um, we will open those breakout rooms. And I have, there are a few other teaching and learning specialists here who will be spread out across the rooms as well. So lots of CTRL folks for you to talk to and your colleagues. I'll open the rooms now and then we'll come back together in like 15 minutes to debrief. Hi everyone, welcome back from breakout discussions. You know, we only have a few minutes left in the session, but just briefly, um, Mary Catherine and I can summarize what our groups talked about so that people in the other rooms have a sense of um, some of the awesome ideas that were being shared, a lot of validation and acknowledgement of what people are already doing, which is great. Um, in our room, we talked a lot about how far it can go when you're really explicit with students about um, being human and, and opening up that space for students to come to you when they're having challenges, asking those questions about how students are doing, acknowledging that students are feeling stress and, flex and that you are flexible. Um, and the, also another idea that came up is that when you're noticing students are kind of down or low on energy or needing a little bit of a break that turn that into a time for review um, and that going over material that they've already learned can help to boost their confidence and help to prepare them for new material. So sometimes students might be ready to um, review and kind of deepen their knowledge of something that you've already talked about, but not ready to take on new information. So recognizing that. Um, and establishing yourself as a resource. Mary Catherine. Um, yeah, we talked about a, a bit of a variety of things. We had some um, interesting perspectives, um, a coach and a social worker and um, the different ways that trauma can show up in, in students um, and, and deal with it. But a lot of great ideas about like how to help students build tools to engage productively with those emotions and um, how we can just give flexibility within like build in flexibility within our course. Um, we talked about like just random days off sometimes either built into the schedule or not or um, days where showing up is optional or um, Mac mentioned the labor-based grading or different creative grading practices that can take some of the stress away. Lots of different ideas um, in, in different um, positionalities with it on campus that engage students in different ways. Very interesting conversation. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so to close us out, uh, this is, feel free to put some ideas in the chat, but more just a reflection question for you all to take with you as you move on to the rest of your day. How might you apply what you learned here today? So hopefully, um, you have some new ideas or things that you're thinking about as we continue on with the semester and supporting our students. Um, I believe Lindsay Studer will be dropping an evaluation link in the chat. So we really appreciate your feedback on these sessions. Um, They're a little different than our typical workshops. So we always appreciate the, the feedback on how this works for you all and other potential topics that we could add to the Brain Fuel series. Um, as always, you can request a one-on-one -on -one consult if you ever want to talk about this in more detail with one of us. Um, we have a few more upcoming events, although 
we typically, this is kind of getting to the close of our event schedule for the semester since we're getting to the end of the semester, um, keep in mind, and then always explore our resources, stay in touch, and hope to see you again soon. Thanks everyone for being here.